front seater has to use a little bit of afterburner, which is like burning even more gas to get us into the release staple. We dropped the, the second bomb, the third attempt. It goes off and it just fuses like in the middle of the, of the crevice and it just sends a shockwave through the whole valley. And while the weapon's in flight, it's like it's in the air for 30 seconds. It's going to fly for like four miles or something like that. And so you, as soon as you go, it goes do weapons away. You always do a wing up to make sure that the bomb didn't wobble when it came off or have a, a battery failure. You can see it immediately. Weapon comes down, hits exactly, and the Jade's hack is like a stack. He's like, beautiful, beautiful. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served Warzone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we have the second round interview with Mike Paco Benitez, where we dig deep into a series of combat experiences in the air that you will not believe, including a low pass to danger close strafing run, covering two troops in contact almost simultaneously. Paco's description of the operation where he earned his distinguished flying cross, you'll feel like you're in the cockpit with him. Mike now creates and distributes the Merge, the Merge.co newsletter, which has 20,000 subscribers and podcast, which has 40 episodes as of this airing. The Merge brings defense and tech news and insights in a more lighthearted and interesting approach that I'm confident listeners of Combat Story will appreciate. We only found Paco thanks to former guest Ryan Stinger Fischel, who is a beneficiary of the tough love and tutelage of Paco, and Stinger mentions Paco in his own interview. Stay tuned for a follow-on episode next week with Paco and Tom Gunny Moser interviewed together about their experiences leading sorties in Afghanistan and Syria. Can you talk through the fatality that you just kind of referenced? I mean, your first deployment in the cockpit like this, a month or so in, you lose an air, an entire aircraft and two crew members. Like yeah. Two, the, yeah. At the time. So, so strafe was identified as like the most dangerous thing you can do. A strafing run? A strafe pass. Why? Uh, well, the, well the, for a few reasons, the Strike Eagle wasn't really, well, the F-15 was designed to do air to ground originally. It was adapted. Well, one of the things that the F-15 has, it has a two degree up cant in the gun. And that, that up cant in the gun is to give it an advantage in air to air. I don't need to pull as much lead to actually have a gun solution. It's, it's built into the airframe. The bad part is if you're pointing it at the ground, you actually have to point the jet steeper to get the gun to to go where you want it to go. So if you want to if you want to have a thirty degree wire for the where you want to put the gun, you have to aim the jet thirty two degrees. So it. and the symbology is backwards from what you would normally see in a, in a in a missile or a bomb. So there's a little bit there's a lot of nuances that can really bite you. Um, and then you use active ranging, so it it uses basically to where the where the target is and it, it computes it's not altitude based it's range based so range to open fire range to cease fire uh and there's a lot of nuances it again the jet wasn't designed to do it we've adapted it for it and so strafe at night strafe in particular was identified like this is the most dangerous thing because you're pointing yourself at the ground with systems that weren't necessarily designed for it and at the end of the day like if, if you've seen a you've seen a 20 millimeter uh, strafe pass, you've seen effects of a 30 millimeter strafe pass. Like the 20 millimeter gun is not never designed to do it. It has a it, it can play a role in, in air support. It's not this. It's not a tank killer. It's not going to take out. Uh, it's not going to do the things that a 10 is going to do or or a hair or or really like a 25 millimeter. It was designed to be an air to air gun. Um, and so you can do things like you can lay down like to break contact. You can, but w one of the things you don't really care about n too much in air to ground is, is like having a very tight pattern of bullets. You really want to quote a bad strafe pass to actually lay down a string of bullets or a row of bullets or something that has a more distributed effect. Right. And, and these are like one second gun bursts, by the way, because they're shooting a hundred rounds a second and there's only 500 rounds. So these are hundred, maybe 150, uh, around passes so there's a lot of things going on you have like that one second window to basically pull the trigger get off the trigger get into your g's a safe escape so you you maintain your altitude and i hit the ground um so there's a lot of things going on the jet at the time was had some known issues of of hey this this will bite you that'll bite you that'll bite you and then it had a couple of unknown things that just weren't really considered and so this is july July, 2009, uh, we had a, one of our squ our squadron guidance was like, Hey, this is dangerous. 
We're going to make sure you block off a little extra gas on your, on your way back to base after your missions, find an open area, core, do the coordination and do a couple of dry passes, right? Like you don't want to, you want to screw this up when it counts. You like, might as well just take that pressure off you and just go practice it. Right? Like that is a sound, sound guidance, sound guidance. Uh, so in this case, uh, it was about 3 a.m. Uh, squire, uh, two jets are coming back from somewhere down in Kandahar back to Bagram. They stop in a dry lake bed that's uh, like west of Kabul. There's a, a dry lake bed. And for those of you who don't know, you think dry lake bed and you think Afghanistan and things like that. Like the the one thing that most people I don't think realize is altitude and elevation is dramatically different across that country, like dramatically. So the place that they had chosen to do their, their strafe pass was a dry lake bed and it was in a, so lake bed, then you have mountains on the sides of it. Uh, what they d- failed to realize at the time was the floor of the dry lake bed was 10,000 feet. It was some, uh, might've been 10. It was up there. It was like, it was a significant elevation um maybe not 10 maybe it was yeah maybe not 10 it was up there is it important as you said like in my mind as a rotary wing guy i obviously think of power margin and concern what is the concern as you describe how high this is it's not power margin it's your it's your expectation right because you're flying an msl and if you pick a target set that is way higher than you think you have way less time than you think and so you have you know, if I'm at 10,000 feet and I'm on a 30 degree dive, like my mental clock tells me that's like, Hey, I've got a solid nine seconds before I have to be able to pull away from the ground. Something like that. Right. You do enough straight passes. You kind of figure it out. Well, when you're at that same, when you look at the cockpit, you see that same altitude, but then you change the target elevation way higher. You know, you're cutting that expected time in half. And so this, in this case, the crew didn't realize the difference. But hey, you have way less time on final than you think. And actually, the the flight lead who went through on on the first pass actually aborted. It was a kind of a shooter shooter. The flight lead went through first to experienced guys. They actually aborted their pass because they were like, "Ooh, this is happening way too fast. I'm, I'm off parameters." Like they abort. Well, they didn't really communicate. Like, hey, this is like funny. And number two is just following through their pattern, right? Because number one sets the pattern. Like, okay, they rolled in there. Like, okay, that's it. Like, that's the point. I'm going to roll in. And you're as a good number two, you're trying to be like in position of correcting. No news is good news from flight lead. So they roll in off the same point, which was way inside of their safety parameters, way less time to react. They don't realize that they don't have this time. And so they're on a basically a 30 degree dive at 450 knots and fly right into the ground. And the the tape is like eerily quiet up until like the moment of impact. Like I had no idea they were about to die. It, yeah. So that's interesting there wasn't like, Oh damn, we're, we're now in this and it's too late. It was just like, they didn't even realize it. Yeah. There was actually a, a there was a slight breakdown in the, the ranging. And so the Wizzo was moving this targeting pod and I can't remember is the radar or the laser ranging at the point, but there was a, there was this discussion because the parameters were off. The pilot was looking for the symbology of the targeting pod. The targeting pod was off. And so there was a little bit of back and forth and not realizing again, that they had half as much time as that they had like mentally, you know, anticipated yeah. and they just set up the pilots trying to like get right on parameters right as he flies into the ground. And you knew these two. Yeah. Yeah. So Tom, um, what's, what's it like the next day the oh. squadron deployed? That was that terrible. Happens? That was terrible. Yeah. The, we actually, uh, we suspended ops for like less than a day and we're like, Hey, we, we need you to gotta keep going. Like, we got, yeah, we got to like stay on mission is what they would have wanted. And part of the, uh, oh, yeah, it was terrible. So part of the, the investigation, like, because it's like ad hoc, it's like, okay, we're going to like save the media. Uh, we actually had uh, a bunch of task force guys at, I think not Salerno. Where was the FOB? Chapman. At FOB Chapman. That might've been. In Coast. Yeah. Those guys, those guys launched like within minutes of like hearing of a F of dude, a dude flight going down, dude one four. And those guys were on the scene, like, you know, yeah, immediately. So that, that, I mean, that was, that was great to see like that effort the next day. Um, I didn't even, I, I wasn't, I was in crew rest cause I was on a, on the day train and there was a night sortie. So I heard about it when I woke up in the morning I'm like, uh, and then we, we didn't fly for, it was like one shift. And then the next day, uh, I went out flying 
and part of the like the accident investigation like okay we have we have to figure out what's going on and uh man i actually had to go and fly the pattern to like recreate no the mess up yeah so like we're flying uh day pass day strafe passes like like pointing at the wreckage and you could see it right i mean this oh, is yeah. like a no, you can debris see, field you can see that it's like a splat debris field you have the safety guys on the ground and like like we're just doing the drive straight passes to gather the data to like figure out like you know what happened so in between like uh you know we go do that and then go do like a support do some air support and come back and i forgot which one we did first but it was like hey we need you for like 45 minutes to go do straight passes like to, to gather data and then you can go do your mission it's like yeah yeah, for for people listening, we had uh, Stinger on the show, um, who, who you know obviously, and the way he and he connected us, and one of the things he's told me a few times now is like how how important your mentorship was for him in terms of like how 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 closely you stayed to tactics and like really dug into weapon system employment and and what you did in the aircraft. And I wonder if it comes from moments like this of, Hey, this thing went wrong. Oh, absolutely. And like, you're, you're more mature than a Lieutenant, obviously at that time, like you're older than your average Lieutenant, but you're still early in your flying career. So it probably has to have a significant impact. Yeah. Know, know your systems, know your weapons. Cause you know, that's, it's literally life or death. And the, the amount of things at the time, it's easy to go back and look at it. And at the time I was like, this is weird, but I, I, you don't know any better. I'm pretty young, but when you look back, you go you know, like, this is like, it was, it was just a failure of, of just systemic failure of just standardization of tactics and employment, knowing like, what are the cost benefits? What are the risks? Like, how do we minimize the risk? How do we, how do we make everyone, how do we standardize things, which is how you reduce risk and optimize performance. That's like military one-on-one, like that didn't even exist. And even knowing like the nuances of how, and there, there, again, there's some nuances in the systems that don't exist anymore, but at the time they were in the system, like some of those were known, some of them they weren't, and they all just came together at the wrong time, which, which made this thing happen. These are some, and I have a lot of scar tissue from other, other things that, you know, you depend on it when, when it, you know, when the chips are down, it matters and it fails. Like your systems fail, your weapons fail. And yeah, I brought that mentality when I went to operational tests, like for the last three or four years of my career, because I've, I've been burned as the, as the war fighter being given stuff that, that was like, this does not work as, as advertised. Why didn't it work? Like, Oh, we didn't, we didn't test it to that, to that thing. Like why? Like, Oh, we just ran out of time or budget. Like you could have like told someone like, Hey, this has been untested. We've never actually done this before. Uh, so little precursor to what happened in Syria. <laughs> you, you said you, you kind of jokingly mentioned before we recorded that, and Stinger had mentioned something similar that you were a bit of a tough guy, uh, not a tough guy. I don't mean to, in that sense, like you're tough on the newer people, but I mean, it's hard to see here. Cause you're, you're like such a, you're smiling the whole yeah. time as we're talking. Does it come from those types of moments? Yeah. I had a lot of scar tissue from, uh, I had a lot of, I had a lot of good weapons officers when I was young, but also knowing like where those, like the things that are going to kill you are the things that you're not going to see. So knowing like being into the depth of the systems, how do the systems work? What are the capabilities and true limitations of those systems? And then how can I bring that knowledge to bear when I need to, to bring it? So in, in Afghanistan, which is interesting, I'd say probably if you look at like the peak at the peak of Afghanistan, there was probably 400 fobs and cops, 130,000 troops on the ground. And like the number of aircraft doing air support didn't change the number of JTACs. Like you didn't just make a hundred thousand extra JTACs, right? Like the JTACs weren't with the, the people who needed air support. They put them in talks and used radios and the number of, uh, you know, air support requests was one up like 10 X and so you'd go out and, and there, there was a point it was almost comical to even brief anymore because like, well, I've got like a 1% chance of doing any mission I've ever briefed. Like, can you, can anyone, does anyone have any data that you've executed any mission that's been briefed the past two months? Like, no. Zero. Cause you're, cause you're taking off and, yeah. and you get it, called it's, to go It's a pickup game. Else. So you take off. It's like, I remember like you brief one thing and after the brief, which your brief's like 20 minutes long, 
out of the brief and tells like, okay, here's your new mission. Like, all right, I'm going to get dressed. And at step at the, at the step desk. All right, here's your new mission. Here's a new one. And then you get started. It's like, call one ready to copy. We've got you a new mission. And then when you get ready to take off, it's like, oh, oh, here's your new mission. So you get like retasked five times before you even get airborne. So you couldn't rely on like, like what's the plan? Let me go call the JTAC. You'd have to know like, what are the, what are the tools that I need to have to be able to problem solve? Cause like the one thing that was like completely a certain every day that you showed up to work to go fly a mission, you have no idea what's going to happen. No idea. <laughs> so you'd show up and, and it's just like, okay, where are we going? Who is this? And you just try to like figure it out. And like, what's, what's the ground. And sometimes like tone, like guys screaming on the radio and you hear like firefight, like, okay, like this is this like, okay, like dial it up. Let's, we, we're here to, we're here to help. And sometimes it's like you dial, you, you come in, it's like, here's your nine line. And like, oh, all right. Right into your processes, procedures, make sure you have the rules of engagement, the spins, everything's good. You're deconflicted for like your, you know, helicopters, like coordination traffic and you know, yada, yada, yada. But sometimes you're like, I need help. Like, okay, like, let's start with that. Talk to me. All right. Like, let's figure this out. So you're constantly problem solving. And like those skills are very, very hard to train to. And the type of training that you do for CAS is sets and reps of like, here's your nine line, go through the process. It doesn't teach you problem solving. Yeah. So I remember when I was in, uh, when, when I'd started my spin up, uh, fast forward just a little bit, Mm. but in Lake and Heath uh, for my fifth deployments where Tom and I were both on, we were, we were deploying to uh, the UAE and we, were, we had like a very minimal support in like 2014 to do like two couple lines a day of air support in Afghanistan. Well, at this point, like most of the squadron had no experience in Afghanistan. There was like four of us, I think, that had ever even been there. Wow. Maybe five of us at this point because they, they, they pulled the Strike Eagles out. So like institutional knowledge is just kind of left. So we started doing spin up like, hey, guys, like. I know like things could go wrong. We don't have a lot of experience in the squadron. Let's, let's make sure that we can not just go through the processes, but like, let's t- give people the problem solving tools. So I remember we kicked off spin up and, uh, we didn't have a JTAC. So I was, uh, we put our, uh, a new flight lead and a younger, uh, Wizzo as a, the number one. And it was like me and someone else as number two. And it was like Friday morning. We we're going to do the, the kickoff of our, of our deployment spin up. And I was going to play the JTAC over the radio. And I kind of give him the scenario, like, here's your target, da, da, da. here's the situation, I'm getting shot at, here's my position, and I'm trying to, like, give it a, a scenario, not, like, the process. Not the perfect nine And line. they're like, uh, uh, I'm like, I need help. And it's like, and I, and I remember at the time, some of the guys in the squadron might remember this, I, and this is, like, 2014, I had, like, a little tiny MP3 player with, like, a AAA battery and a Y cord. And I had on it, I had a bunch of just like tracks from like YouTube of like firefight mm-hmm. and I would play it and I would key the mic and I'd be like, I need help. And you could, and, and they're like, Oh my God, what's going on? And you're just trying to like, you know, jar them into the reality. And again, this is just like doing circles in the sky, just over the radio. There's nothing on the ground. And, and so like, I need help. And I, I basically, the J, as the JTAC talked them into like dropping on this building and it's like good effects, this and that come back and they go through all the, they did everything by the book. Correct. Right. And that wasn't the lesson though. So we come back and uh, I lead weapons af- academics that afternoon as uh, the weapons officer always does and kick it off. Like, welcome to spin up this and that. Um, uh, we are going to start a great, uh, on a great lesson, you know, so-and-so you guys led the first, uh, spin up ride doing close air support today. You guys did great. Unfortunately we have a civ cast event. You just killed 10 women and children. And you're like, what? You're like, yeah, you, you didn't, you didn't ever ask what was in the building that you dropped on. You just assumed that it was like free and clear. Like we can't go in Afghanistan with that mentality. Like that is not the type of conflict. It's not like here's your nine line drop like that. You <laughs> we've done that enough to lose the war hearts and minds. Like one bomb will never win the war. One bomb will certainly lose the war. And there's obviously like the strategy in play about that. But bringing that problem solving, like, well, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Is it the problem you're starting to solve isn't killed, like destroy the building. It saved the good guy. You're like, well, what is, the, what is the commander's intent? So I always brought it back to like, you ask better questions, get better answers. What mm-hmm. is the commander's intent? What is he trying to do? Like, how did he get in the situation? He's like, oh, he's just trying to go home. Like, okay, so if you break contact, is there a way that you can go home? Like, yes, there certainly is. Okay, how do I break contact? So you go through that problem solving to like, you don't want to unnecessarily escalate something and create a, make a bad situation worse. So those types of things, like it's critical thinking and problem solving, but there's no 
book. Yeah. There's, there's not like a syllabus to like do that. So it's it's transfer of knowledge to experiences. And so I was I was a big fan, and you know Hart and Stinger and those guys, especially back then, is I was always a big fan of like in the military. One thing is for certain is that number one, you typically don't get to pick your team. <laughs> and then number two is like the team is going to continually shift. Like people are going to come, people are going to go, including me. And so there's going to be a point where I leave. And so my, you know, my North star when on that assignment as a, as a weapons officer was to, to make sure that whoever was going to replace me was better than me. And if I couldn't do that, then like I'd failed. So it's, it's, it's like this responsibility you felt to get yeah. them ready and it's less Absolutely. about making you all feel good. It's, you've seen the outcomes of these mistakes yeah. firsthand. One of the things that, that you had shared with me beforehand that I've said often, and I want to read it here. You mentioned, you know, you, you flew, you know, probably close to 250 cast type missions, 2009, 2010. Um, boredom to crisis in a radio call, like, which I know very well, like you're just out there hanging out. And then all of a sudden, like things light up. But what you said that really struck me was, you know, you get this on call 911, basically for someone who's having the worst day of their life. And I often felt that where there wasn't enough aviation to go around, as you've already alluded to, especially that time when Iraq was so, uh, was a priority. So there just wasn't a lot of of avia- attack aviation to go around. And so really, if you were getting called in on something, it's because it was bad. And that guy on the ground is probably having the worst day of their life or close to it or yeah. that deployment for sure. So there's a lot of responsibility that comes with like getting that right and being there. And you mentioned these guys on the radio, sometimes they're screaming. And like you notice the tone change when things are really getting tight around them. And it just makes it even harder. Like you want to put a bomb or something down there to help them break contact. So I yeah. guess, um, could you talk through any of the other moments that kind of remind you of that or that that come to mind, those types of, of flights that you were a part of? Yeah, I, one of the things I used to tell the young younger wizards is like, you know, when you check in, what you don't want to, <laughs> you probably, at, at a little levity, if you ever check in, like you're doing a task force mission and and the JTACs, are, they're talking to you and they're like, they're like whispering like, hey, and then you start whispering back. You're like, why am I whispering? <laughs> right? Like, this makes no sense. I'm in an aircraft. Like, I don't need to whisper. Like, they have a volume on their radio, but they're whispering because, right? So that you, you type typically like the mirroring of of the, the language. I, I try to, I used to tell the younger guys, like, be very careful of that because if someone on the ground is like in a bad position and and there you can tell when they need help and they're the stress in their voice, their elevated voice, like, do not mirror that back to them. Like you have Stay to be cool. the voice of reason. Yeah. No matter how much they're, when they're telling you this situation, like you, you have to just deliberately be calm, cool, collected. It's not because you're trying to sound cool on the radio. It's because you're trying to bring order to that man or woman's chaos and like to, to help. And the first way you can help is act like you're going to help <laughs> and then you can help. Yeah. And with like, do you remember, are there other experiences where like you're kind of helping these people in their dire moments? Yeah. Yeah. There's been a, there's been a few, there's some of them are, uh, or yeah, there's, there's a, I got a bunch of them rattling around my head right now. I remember I got called to a emergency cast, uh, done a couple of them. So emergency cast is you have an air support request, but there's no JTAC. There's no one that's certified to control air. And sometimes it's like, Hey, that's a, um, that's a fires observer who is very good about artillery has, he's just not qualified. Sometimes it's just someone with the radio. Uh, so I've had a couple of them where it was literally someone with the radio, never talked to an aircraft before in their life. Uh, so there was one, it was a night mission. And I remember this, uh, it was a Humvee. It was like Northwest of Kandahar. I want to say, but it was a, it was an ECAS. It was pretty, or not Kandahar, um, Bagram. And it was, we got called with this ECAS and that typically everyone goes like, what's like everyone drops what they're doing when you hear that, because like something has gone wrong. That should not, that should never happen. That's why it's called emergency gas. So we, uh, we roll over to this radio and there's no check-in. All the processes go out the window because the guy on the ground doesn't know anything. And so Is he uh, army, you know, uh, I don't remember. I don't probably an army. And 
I forgot the situation, but he ended up being like isolated by himself in a Humvee, like away, uh, separated, and he was getting shot at. And like, I, I don't even know how it got to the situation. Maybe his uh, radio operator got shot. At, I can't remember. But I remember distinctly being, and he was just like yelling on the radio. I'm like, all right, um, where are you? Which is a terrible question, by the way. <laughs> I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm here. Like, not helpful. Not helpful. Like, okay. So I'm trying to, again, problem solving. Uh, like, okay, what, like, w- describe what's going on around you. So he's like, there's some V, da, 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 I'm getting shot at. Um, please help me. It's at night. I'm like, so you're in a Humvee. Does the Humvee work? You're like, yes. Like, okay. Start flashing your headlights. And so me and the friends here, I've, we have our gogs on. We're just looking out we're like, oh. I see it. I see the Humvee. Jeez. So like, okay, we found him. And so we're like, okay, like we found you like, okay. If the, the front of the car, the back of the car, the driver's side and the passenger side, which direction of the car are you getting shot from? It was like very basic stuff. It's like, okay, like the passenger side. Okay. That's, you know, that's Southeast. Okay. Uh, and so we, we start like, okay, looking for tracers and things like that, but just that kind of problem solving, we, we end up doing a show of force on that. And then we coordinated a convoy to kind of, um, um, not a convoy, a QRF. There mm-hmm. you go. Some of these terms are falling off my oh, iceberg, I know. you know, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> so we coordinated QRF. We kind of do the overwatch, we do a show of force, but, uh, those kinds of things you're like, like, what? I don't even know how this happened, but, uh, there was another situation we got called in and, there's sometimes you get radio calls and you're like, I don't think I heard that correctly. hundred percent true story. So we got a, there was another mission. We were doing something else and a tick opens and it's a, it's a weird call sign. It's not a JTAC call sign. It's like a ground commander. It's like check in with ground commander, which ends of the six. And I'm like, Oh, ground commander. Like that's weird. And it's like, yeah, it's a, it, it's like a, it's a, they're surrounded by like 50 Taliban on motorcycles. It's like, what? It's like, I don't know what's going on here. So we, we check in and this, cr- this crew, they're like, Oh my God, thank God. We finally found someone I'm like, what do you, what's going on? And it's, uh, he was an air, I think it was an air force. Oh man. I want to say it was an air force Intel guy that got embedded with the army and they're out They're They're out on like a multi-day, like, op and there's maybe like 20 of them they got separated somehow took a wrong turn extended their op they're out of bullets they're out of water they're out of food they're on their last battery of the radio and they're like and they're and now in contact I'm like what like how did this happen so we uh, i want to say we did a couple strafe passes on, on that again we're like trying to break contact get a qrf rolling and just again you're just like you have the we have radios, we have range, we have sensors, like we're here to help. So things like that. And, and those guys actually came to the squadron. It was like a week later when they, they cycled back through and came over to the squadron to, to meet us. That's so, awesome. Yeah. They They're like, thank you so much. Yeah. What were they doing? I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. Th- those details I can't remember, but I do remember mm-hmm. the call. It's like 50 Taliban on motorcycles. That seems suspect. Gang. Yeah. It's biker Angels. gang. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Candle, yeah whatever. Biker club. Yeah. yeah. Just a quick word from our sponsor, Give Legacy, and we'll get right back to this combat story. I was really excited to bring Give Legacy to our listeners. Veterans and members of the armed forces have twice the risk of infertility than the general population. Sperm health can be affected by lifestyle, age, injury, and environment, including exposure to toxic chemicals such as those in burn pits, radiation, and pollutants. Hundreds of men in high-risk occupations like police, firefighters, and members of the military use Legacy to test and freeze their sperm. This will allow them to produce biological children, even if the unthinkable happens. The military's healthcare system offers limited options for couples diagnosed with infertility and no coverage for proactive fertility preservation. Legacy is committed to supporting the military, veterans, and their family members. Legacy's special relationship with the military includes several partnerships, including free access to Legacy's privacy-protected at-home sperm testing with one year of complimentary cryopreservation service to all Naval Special Warfare operators and Green Berets, and a partnership with Operation Baby Foundation that provides grants of up to $5,000 to military couples diagnosed with infertility to assist with treatment, surrogacy, and adoption costs. You can find out more by going to www.givelegacy.com. That's givelegacy.com. Listeners can use the code combat story to get 10% off everything on the site. And now back to this combat story. Um, when do you earn your DFC? Is that 
Oh, uh, that's it, that's uh, 2014. Okay, so uh, so just very quickly, I want to touch on because you go to the fighter weapons school, right? Yep. When do you get tapped for that? Uh, after my second deployment, so I did the second deployment for the rockets. At this point, I had like 200 combat sorties in the Strike Eagle, just over 200, about 1500 hours, and so I was uh, it's pretty experienced before I went to the weapons school, and then. Uh, went to weapon school in 2010 or 2012. I was actually supposed to be in Tom's class and uh, I got, I got slipped to class because uh, I adopted our, our youngest son and he's uh he's Korean and it messed up my security clearance. And somehow in the magic world, can't make this up again. I lost my weapon school spot because I adopted a kid and I lost my, uh, uh, you keep all the clearances you have, but you're not allowed to get expanded clearances until like you can resolve your foreign national I have a foreign relative turns out and it got so bad that I had to fill out. I can't, I can't make this up. I had to fill out this questionnaire about my foreign relative who is three years old and doesn't speak English by the way. And it was, it was like, if, if your foreign relative like asked details about your job, like what are, what is your response? And like, it's a, this is a government questionnaire, like the process. The three-year-old. So I like, well, I'm just going to fill it out. Like, like, 100% truthful. I'm like, I will give him cookies. And I got in trouble. Like, do you think this is a joke? I'm like, do you not understand what's going on right now? So I actually had to uh, uh, route a request up to the wing command level. I was like, listen, like, I'm going to file an IG complaint if this isn't fixed. Like, this is, th- I've spent six months dealing with security paperwork for adopting a three year old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yada, yada, yada. I, uh, I delayed. I went to finally. weapons school finally. Uh, and then right after that, uh, Tom had gotten assigned to Lake and Heath. I was supposed to go to, to Idaho. That's what everyone told me. At the end of the class, like, here's your orders. You're going to Lake and Heath. I'm like, what? Which is England. <laughs> Which is England. Listening. Yeah. It's not Idaho. Yeah, not Idaho. Not Idaho. Turns out the other side of the world. So uh, at, so that happens. We, I get there, rejoin with Tom at Lake and Heath, and then almost like immediately this thing called the Budget Control Act uh, hit and sequestration grounded like the entire Air Force. Uh, so we we got put in a weird position. Our squadron uh, had a had a real world mission that would not allow us to stop flying completely. So we had to we had to create a, an A team and a B team. Like the B team, like sorry, you're not going to fly for the next like six months. And the A team, because of the way the the Budget Control Act was, we, you could only fly the bare minimum to maintain your currency. But like, no, you couldn't be good at anything. It was like just on paper that you're That's still dangerous. Huh? Oh, very. Yeah, and it was so bad because we're like, well, as you probably know, like in, in in flying, like it's not just you go fly. You have to go plan. You fly it, and the most important part is debrief. So for like the first few weeks it, it was and they wouldn't give us any extra air crew but we had to maintain certain amount of air crew and crew rest for, for this on-call real world mission because it was a standing 24-hour requirement that someone so we had mathematically this many people always have to be in crew rest and so you kind of have a wave of that and then the people who aren't in crew rest can only they have to show up to work you only get this many people because of the budget so we it, we only had enough resources and this is like this is comically stupid but we only had enough resources at the time where someone else would plan everything for you you would you would walk into the squadron go directly into flight equipment get dressed you would go to the ops desk and at your step brief someone else would tell you here is the plan i planned for you and so you're like okay and it's not like you get an hour brief you get like a five minute brief of something you have no idea what you're supposed to go do you go and you fly to get your like yes i flew a sortie as soon as you land they would, someone would be at the desk and take your, your media and all of your stuff. You would d- take your flight equipment, hang it up and you go into crew rest. You would never see your tapes. You would never debrief. Like no one ever tell you what happened. And, and then you would rinse and repeat that. And it was like, come on, this is, and, t- and Tom, Tom and I lived through this. I'm like, this is, this is dumb. Like we're going to kill someone. Number one, number two, like this is like stretching the truth of like what readiness is like this is not this is not what right looks like so we uh we've gotten extra a few extra positions to kind of resolve that eventually but we had like a port and starboard where half the squadron didn't fly at all and half barely flew and then when that got log jam got kind of unstuck now we have to requalify the like 
uh, not only like half of our squadron, but our sister squadron. <laughs> so, so we're in this like rebuild airmanship phase. Oh, by the way, we have a deployment coming up. So we were the first squadron to deploy out of sequestration. And then when we, you know, you fill out your deployment readiness stuff and we're like, red, 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 red. Turns out no one reads them. You red deploy being bad. Anyways. Red you being bad. You want it to be green. Yeah. 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 Green's good. Red bad. Yeah. And so, you know. Well, our, you can still deploy. Yeah. Our, and our squadron commander, like he, good on him. He's like, no, like you did this to us. This is, this is, and like, you can't report that because then you're non-deployable. Like you put us in the situation. You wanted us to report the situation you put us in. I'm giving you good the truth. On good on him. And they're like, oh, well, we're going to deploy you anyways. And it's like, and so then we show up in, in CENTCOM in the Middle East and the squadron who had been there, they hadn't, they hadn't lived through the groundings or anything. They were just kind of, and, and at the time it was, it was pretty good flying, mostly training. Again, a couple lines a day in where, Afghanistan. Where are you out of? Doha? Uh, UAE. UAE, uh, okay. Yeah, like Abu Dhabi. So it was a, it was a smaller, most time at the time, combat deployments were doing 18 jets. We're like, Hey, we're going to scale this down. Things are dying off the middle East. 12 jets is all you're going to get 12 jets. Good. We'll bring the crews we can and replace the uh, squadron. It's there. It's been flying and kind of enjoying it, doing mostly training a couple of lines a day. And we show up and we're like, Hey, like, what are all these extra people around here that are flying? And like, oh, they're all like the de- the deployed, like, you know, lieutenant colonels and colonels and the, the one star, the wing commander. Like, yeah, they just they just fly the lines. I'm like, these aren't strike you guys. These are like F-16 guys. Like, yeah, they have drug deals that they're, we've allowed them to fly in our squadron. And I remember our squadron commander going like, Let me, I want to see the orders from everyone. And it's like, if they're non-flying orders, like grounded, grounded, grounded. They got a huge, huge doing the right thing. It's like, probably wasn't popular. No. I'm guessing. Yeah, so this new squadron shows up and grounds all the attached flyers that have been you know deployed there for a while, and he's like, "Listen, here's the deal: like our guys need every hour to like we are not ready to be here, and like so we had to go show here's our readiness. So again, being honest, yep. because he was honest in the beginning, it's like I told well, everyone it's something to show. Yeah, so it's something to show. So we're in the fat we were deployed, basically rebuilding squadron readiness at the time, and we were, we were mostly there. We still had a little ways to go, and then we're kind of managing that because. We could because we were only flying a couple lines a day in Afghanistan. It was like one, two ship a day. And then once a week, the the carrier would take their day off and then we would surge and fly like six lines or something, right? So that's that's how that started. Um, and this is May. And so because of that, we're kind of managing that, that crew risk like I was telling you about before. Mm-hmm. So I'm on a sortie in May and we I'm flying with a very sharp... Um, Flight lead, actually, is an instructor at this point. Um, the first deployment, this is his first op squadron. He was a sharp guy. I put him through the upgrade pretty fast. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, like you and I will lead it. This will be great. And then our number two was a, an experienced front seater and a, and a newer back seater, right? So we, uh, we, we fly up. Oh, by it's a thousand mile trip each way. So a thousand miles. Where? Where are you going? Afghanistan. Okay. So you have to take off from the UAE, like fly like around Iran, up through Pakistan, the boulevard, up through Afghanistan. So a thousand miles, got a little bit of a trek. And we usually take a tanker with us to drag us there. And so we, we get there and, and I realize when we're, we're working north of Kandahar and as we check in, we switch, we switch over data links and you can kind of zoom out and see what's going on and who's where. And I'm like, oh, there's a, oh, there's a tick open. Like, okay. There's like, you can see the, there's a B1 on station. Like, okay. Like we, we don't, I'm just like monitoring it. Like that tick's been open for a little bit and we're, we go work and we're working something that's like maybe 30, 50 miles North. So it's, it's almost within like radio range of what's going on over there, but not quite. Um, and not within sensor range, but we we're probably on station for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, actually a little bit longer now. Cause I think we got gas. Yeah. We just got gas and we get called to go support this tick. And I was like, Oh, it was a tick that I, that's been open for a while. I've been tracking and so we show up and there's a, a B1 that's on station, kind of gives us a handoff. They have to leave. It's like, yeah, we dropped the, we, 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 we want kinetic. Okay, great. Like there's your standard processes for like an AO handoff. Like we weren't getting like the information, like what, what's going on? Like, well, we dropped, we dropped the weapon. Like, what did you drop? Like we dropped this weapon. Where did you drop it? Like, uh, like standby. Like what? This is from the B1. <laughs> yeah. So it was, a, it was a, it was a pretty iffy handover. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't know what's going on right now. Like, how is this? You, you dropped the bomb. The tick's still open. I don't understand what's going on. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. So, so, so he, so he leaves, there's an MQ one, which you didn't know at times an MQ one on station that's above us. So a drone is yeah, a drone. drone. 
yeah, there's an arm drone. He's he's above us, and actually, I do know that because we're we're altitude limited, so we're at a weird altitude. Um, the B one leaves, the MQ one's there, and we're we're talking with. We get this uh, handed off to this JTAC. We're like, hey, dude, dude is on station, I'm like ready for uh, AO update, and it's just like a zombie was the name of the JTAC, and uh, didn't know it at the time. But, like the background is like, okay, like what's going on. And he's like, we're, we're pinned down. We're getting shot at. We have uh, friendlies and all these locations. I'm like, Oh Jesus. Like, but he doesn't have any of the information. Remember the B one already went kinetic. But like, well, where are the friendlies? Like, let's start with that. Like, where are you? Like, okay, we'll start with you. Like, where, where are you at? And he's pinned down, getting shot at. It's like, just read me some coordinates. Like, give me something to go with. I see a lot of things. I don't know what's going on. So like, okay, we found, we know there's four friendly positions. There's like 40 ish, 41 Americans, something like that. There's four positions. They had tried to do this daylight uh, raid into this IED factory that's built into this cave complex, and it turned out to be an ambush. So that that was the situation we figured out. The JTAC was on uh, what I I still believe was his first ever like not not um, um, control in a combat situation. His first patrol. Like his first one and he's in this situation. And so he's a little disoriented. And so he's given us like, car- like cardinal directions are just like 90 degrees off. Like just flat out. Like I, let's just start with the basics. Like, give me a grid, uh, give me a six digit grid or something. Give, where are you? It's like, okay, I, I see you. He's like, yes, we're getting shot up from here. I'm like, great. Where is everybody else? He's like, ah, uh, he's like, they're some of them are over here, some are over there. Like, no, man, like I need to know where everyone is if I need help. Cause like this can go wrong. Trust me. Like, mm-hmm. so we're, we, we figure out the, the two blocking positions on, on to the East and West. We've, we've got eyes on them. And so our systems, we can create little digital marks. And so, okay, mark there, mark there, mark. Okay. I've got three of the four. Where is the fourth position? Like, that's the ones that needs our help. I go, where are they? Like, we don't know. They're pinned down. They're taking fire. And we can't talk with the people that are pinned down. So there's another, there's an FM freak somewhere that somehow that they're talking to, but we don't can't, we, we don't have it. So the, the, the talk is all is monitoring this freak. And so they're rolling in and there's an MQ one overhead. That's kind of like monitoring too. Uh, some Apaches show up. And so they're just like, just, shooting i'm like what i don't understand like where are the friendlies uh so at the same time our targeting pod breaks so we're and we yo-yoed our wingmen so our wingman's gone with the only jet on station our targeting pod breaks it's daylight and we're like and this is east of kandahar so it's rocks and sand and a little bit there's a crevice which is where the little id factory was and we're trying to problem solve all of these things that are happening at once and it, it's sa- it, it when you say it it sounds dumb like hey can we just like do a let's just try to do a visual talk on while we're resetting our systems so we're doing we end up doing like these uh low altitude passes uh back and forth you know down maybe like above the helicopter so maybe like two thousand feet or so but we're trying to like look for things of like something visual like i don't see any people like we're and we're looking for like five people like like it's hiding behind easy. a rock it's, i think people listening it's, think it's easy it's not easy no it's like trying there. to find a person on the ground a mile away right and, and they're hiding so they're purposely not in plain sight so we're uh we're doing that and and i can't remember how it actually happened they, they try to pop smoke and the only smoke they had was yellow i'm like why do you have yellow smoke in the desert in the daytime like not helpful uh so we ended up doing a talk on and like, and I remember a uh, friend, uh, Matt, he's, he's like, uh, and I was like, Hey, if it's, if it's, if you're trying to do a visual talk on, like you have the radios, I'm resetting the system. So we get back up. I have the radios. So we, we had a crew coordination that real quick. So he, he's like, hey, um, do you see, it was like, do you see the like orange rock? It was like the most random radio call. This is so common. Yeah. Do you see the orange rock like in the desert? Right. Like, I do see an orange rock. It's like, <laughs> really? So he, you know, we climbed back up and he's like, they're, they're like, you know, 20 meters. Oh, wait, you actually saw it? Yeah. The rock he was talking about? No, no. Our, the, our, the pilot, Matt, he's like, he's like, ah, uh, it's like, I see an orange rock and the JTAC's like, that's amazing. I see an That's orange amazing. rock. Like okay. the, the most, the ter- most terrible talk on ever. Right. Like, yeah. the, and if you did it in training, you would fail the ride. Right. Yeah, like, for sure. but we're like, there's a lot of options. We're trying to find like, you know, problem solve. Right. 
So like, yep, uh, I see the rock. He's like, great. The, they're, the rock that they're pinned down is not that rock, but it's like over here, it's like in a different direction. And so we do, we come back up and as my targeting pod is, is rebooting finally. Uh, so this is like probably five, 10 minutes that it's been like, I've been re- doing everything I can to reset it. I've never had this happen to before. And it's just like the servo. We just want, it just like went high into the right and just like turned itself off. I was like, Oh, at the worst possible time. Never happened to me before. Never happened since. So I get the targeting pod. And as I'm getting the targeting pod back online, I'm like, ah, I've got the pod. Matt, uh, Matt the front seater, he's like, visual friendlies. I see, I see them. And the way the Strike Eagle is mecked is the front seater has a helmet mounted sight. And he can actually like put his reticle on something and do his, his hands on throttle and stick, the HOTAS. And it actually cues the targeting pod to his eyes. So he sees, he's like, visual friendlies? And he, my pod is like, your pod, cues up, and the targeting pod in like TV mode, the cursors go right over this like five or six guys that are huddled behind this rock. Just like, And the guys, one of the guys is shot, by the way, so they're doing the fireman carry, and they're, you can just see the bullets going back and forth. I'm like, oh, okay. Like the, the one missing piece of this problem has been solved. Like we now know where all the friendlies are. So we, uh, the JTAC doesn't want to go kinetic, and so we're we're working through like three or four different problems. I'm sorry, why not? Uh, he was, the, I think him and the ground commander, which are they're co-located, but they're having a discussion that doesn't that wasn't really making sense to us, and it wasn't making sense to his boss either. So the talk, we're like, well, we can do this, we can do that. And he's like, I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, and I'm not taking anything away from the guy on the ground, like just as I remember it. Uh, the 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 talk JTAC. Um, I'm giving like recommendations, like we can we can recommend this, this, and this. I'm like I'm doing all the processes, like basically treating it as emergency cast because he's not giving any information. I'm giving him solution one. No ground commander doesn't want that. Solution two. Ground commander doesn't want that. Solution three. Ground commander doesn't want that. Why don't you just tell me what you want, right? But I can't. But I I'm, I can't get that. So the the talk commander, the like the head JTAC for the region, he's listening and he's got the 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 drone overhead, and he's like, dude, I'm going to take control. I am now the JTAC on scene. I want you to go back in the, the last, the, the last, uh, um, the last thing that you offered, like, that's what we're going to do. Like, okay. Like call him ready for nine line. And it's me telling the JTAC commander, the nine line. And it's not him reading me the nine line. It's cause again, <laughs> cause he's, he's in control of the drone. He's control. He's taking control of the situation. Okay. I'm going to drop my weapons, but he doesn't have the data that I have because I'm on site g- generating the Got idea. It. Right. So he's, he's like, like four and six, my sensors per the talk on eight, you know, four, six, eight restrictions, do that. Um, uh, it's like approved. And then as we're setting up for this attack, the JTAC on the ground comes back on. Oh, and they can't hear each other by the way, which is, the nature of how line of sight radio works. So the two JTACs don't can't hear each other. They don't realize that the and and I'm I've been reading stuff back so the JTAC on the ground can hear me reading back coordinates for something. And and we get pretty good at how we we talk in the radio of of explaining things back to one person knowing that someone else only heard half of the conversation. So he hears me read the coordinates back to his boss of like understand so and so is now in control. We're going to execute this attack, the nine line four and six of my sensors. This is the description. And so I read it back to the other JTAC who's in the firefight can hear it. So then he chimes up. He goes, he goes, stand by, stand by. Ground commander is changing his mind. And it's like, oh. so now it's like the ground commander wants to control again. It's like, I don't care who's in control. I'm just trying to help. Like these guys aren't, their situation's not getting any better. So uh, we end up getting a nine line. We're going to drop a, a, a prox fuse 500 pound weapon down this, uh, this crevice. And it's a, it's a very, it's like, 80 degree crevice with caves kind of inside it. And that's where all of the bad guys are kind of anchored in. So uh, you can't really like direct fire. Wasn't really getting any effects. Like the Apaches were trying to do gun runs, like no effect. And you can just see all the, their fire coming back. So we got, we got to like, yep, we'll put a bomb right down here. We'll prox fuse it right, right in the crevice. And and it's gotta be on a, it was a North South. So it had to be a perfect North South heading. It basically is going to go down and it's going to, ex- the, the radar fuse on the bomb is going to go off. So it's going to explode in the midair in the, in this tiny crevice and basically like take out all of these caves at once. Like that, like that's the plan. It's like, yep, execute it. So get the nine line, do the read back. 
deconflict all of the, the traffic. We were also coordinating at this time a medevac. There's a medevac that's standing, but he can't land to pick up the guy to then go save his life because he's going to get shot down. And so we have the medevac standing over here. We're deconflicting the coordination altitude from the two Apaches. Uh, we roll in, we go to release the the bomb. And again, the only time this has ever happened to me, I get a hung weapon. So it, like the jet told it to fire up and, and let it go. The, the, and it sent the pulse. The weapon is stuck on the jet now. And like the, the timer, like it's, it's a live weapon. And like, it's, oh, it's like stuck. It doesn't need like a certain distance to arm. No, like it is armed. No, it's like we sent and the release hung. pulse and it's hung. And so we're like, uh, like, I don't know what this, what's going to happen here, but like, I do know that the bomb didn't come off. So we're like, ah, uh, like we're like, we have a weapons malfunction. We don't tell the guy on the ground this. We're like, ah, uh, like we don't have time. Like I can spin. So we do basically a 360 degree. And like we put the coordinates into our, another weapon that we have on the jet. We're like, Hey, we have a weapons malfunction. We'll be back in 30 seconds. We roll back in with the, the second bomb, but the first bomb being hung, drop the second bomb, the same attack parameters hits exactly where we want it to go. Uh, boom goes off and it's like, it's like good effects, good effects. And it's like not even five seconds later. It's like cleared immediate reattack. Uh, you, like you, you need to shift your fires like North and North it's the North South crevice. North is closer to where that any, that friendly position was, which he was, he wasn't tracking exactly where they were. We were because we wanted to find them. Right. Uh, so we said, Hey, like I can't shift it any further north otherwise it's going to be it's going to be inside danger close and you don't know where those guys are i do i'm telling you so he said make it as close as you can um at danger close like don't try not to make it inside danger close like okay so i i have a a tool i'm using to like because i know the numbers uh, like how many meters it has to be so i'm like okay i know where they're at here's the meters okay i'm going to drop the next bomb like exactly at danger close and not inside that and then if i need to drop another bomb i'll get closer so uh, we set up on that one and I'm out of GV 38, which are the 500 pound bombs. The only bombs we have left in the jet are the laser guided um, JDAMs, um, which is, is almost exactly the same. It has a laser seeker. It flies a slightly different profile. I'm like, well, I guess I'm just going to drop this laser JDAM as a regular JDAM and just not laze it in. So uh, like, well, I haven't done that before either. So, uh, it's supposed to work as advertised. So how do you do that? Yeah. Uh, it's the same procedures. The, the, the little staple of release is a little different and it flies a little different profile, but it's, it's supposed to work just fine. So like, I just won't laze it. I'll just drop it and not laze it. It'll be fine. And, uh, and I actually went to a training laser in our mode instead of a combat laser because I was trying to generate friendly coordinates. So on our targeting pod, I have this training laser caution because the jet thinks I'm going to laze this bomb in. I'm like, I'm not lazing it in. So I just leave the training laser caution up there to remind me like, yeah, I'm not lazing this thing in. And we, uh, we do the reattacks. We're, you know, a minute later, we're back in. And actually, because we spun, we're really slow and we're really low on gas at this point, by the way. Uh, so our wingman, and I tell you, want, go get go get us a tanker. Uh, so it took him a while to find a tanker, bring it close enough. So he's got a tanker overhead. We've reset our bingo. We've been on station a while. Uh, we reset our bingo, uh, to land in Kandahar, which is like right next door. And we're getting low, like really low on gas. And Kandahar is like 40 miles away at this point. So we're getting like very like emergency fuel, but we, we have to get the second bomb off the jet. There's no way that our wingman's going to come back and be able to do this in the next like 30 seconds. It's like, all right, we're going to stay. We'll do, we'll do one more. And then, uh, so of course we're slow. So uh front seater has to use a little bit of afterburner, which is like burning even more gas to get us into the release staple. We dropped the second, the, the second bomb, the third attempt, uh, it goes off and it just, it, it's like, it's amazing. It, it hits, it goes off and it's, it fuses like in the middle of the, of the crevice and it just sends a shock wave through the whole Valley. And while the weapons in flight, it's like, I remember it's like uh, dude, dude, one, one, like one away, 30 seconds. It's a whole thing you do. It's 30 like second drop. It's like 30, it's, it's in the air for 30 wow. seconds. It's going to fly for like four miles or something like that. And so you, as soon as you go, it goes do weapons away. You always do a wing up and you go good fins to make sure that the bomb didn't wobble when it came off or have a, a battery failure. You can see it immediately. Cause again, I want to know now, not when it, not when it misses. So one of the many habit patterns I've developed over time, it's like, it was part of my crew coordination. It's like ch- chunk wing up good fins. You look at the T impact weapons away to be in there in 30 seconds. Our wingman is checking in. I'm like, cue to my mark. And I'm giving him an AO handoff talk in while the weapon's in flight. So he can cue his targeting pod to where it's going to hit. 
and then he can then take up the the rest of the fight from there so as this is happening we're doing this 30 second ao handoff cue the pod and then uh, we start immediately just climbing up to go to the tanker and the uh, the we don't we see we we don't have a good pod footage of it but our wingman is like perfect position see the and his targeting pod in the debrief weapon comes down hits exactly and the j attack is like a stack he's like beautiful beautiful uh he's yelling at he's very happy so then we uh we get to the tanker and we're at like emergency fuel we we plug in with probably like less than two minutes of of like slop to go and so if we couldn't even like plug in, that would be bad. So we get on the tanker, we're on the tanker, and then I'm using the third radio to coordinate the medevac because now it's like, okay, we've we've squashed the fires. I've given the handoff to our number two, but I'm still like coordinating stuff. I'm like you work with the JTAC, I'll work with the medevac. We get the medevac guys in there, uh, pick them up. We get them out to Kandahar and they will save the guy's life. That's and, amazing. Yeah. So this, you get the DFC for this. It's like the the chaos that you're controlling. Yeah. through this whole yeah. and great effects yeah and then we had the we still had a thousand miles to fly with the hung bombs uh to get back Tell, home so yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot it's live ordnance on the wing and it's been like uh the altimeter has been uh, altimeter is probably wrong like when it's in a certain distance from the ground it's supposed to explode what well, has an arm like a t-arm and so uh so there's a fuse and the fuse has a, a, a T arm, which is like how much from the, like get off my jet to the fuse is alive. And so sometimes it's like 10 seconds. Sometimes okay. it's, you know, six seconds. I can't remember what it was in this. Maybe it was like 20 seconds. Didn't matter what it wasn't. It wasn't two hours. Right. <laughs> so we release like it sends the release pulse to the weapon and like it's hung. And there's two things you have hung. Is it hung secure? which means like it's it's not get flopping in the wind. It's hung unsecure, which means like one of the brace things broke and it's like wobbling in the wind and it's like stuck on the jet. And then you have like it's hung secure, unsecure, and it's like been activated. Like I don't like it could, you know, it, the fuse has like a G sensing, like, you know, it's hit the ground. So it's like a 50 G sense or something like to go off. So like I don't I don't know any of those situations. So we and we didn't know until after all of this happened and we can get our wingman actually rejoin us and like look at our bomb that's stuck on the jet. So then we start going through the like declared emergency. We had to fly through like three countries with like this thing and uh yeah, we got back home, everything was fine. But the just the, the another just like weird curveball in the whole scenario. <laughs> <laughs> did uh did did the front seater get a DFC oh, out yeah, of that yeah. as well? Yeah. That's pretty and amazing. It was uh I remember we we got to the tanker. We didn't we didn't actually say a word. We uh we were going to the tanker because that was like he, very stressful, making sure we, we had the perfect rejoin but on geometry for the tanker because we can't even afford to overshoot. Like we have no gas because of the timing. The timing we zero seconds. With zero seconds. So <laughs> we we plug in. We get the gas. We we get topped off, and then we're like, hey, we 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 worked the emergency so we can. We had a follow on tasking. Obviously, we didn't do that. We we went home as soon as they closed the tick. There was another. Uh, I think it was a French. There was a French formation came in to replace us to uh, f- just for Overwatch while the situation. So then we, we could leave. So we were coordinating to get replaced because we had this emergency. Like we knew we wouldn't want to stay on station because um, we we couldn't do anything. So um, after we get the gas, we do the coordination. We got the medevac. We got the French coming in to replace. And I'm like, you did good. Like that was uh that was the thing. And to like, yourself or no, you said it to the front I, seat. I said, I, I said it's a front seater. I was like that was uh that was a thing. We like you did good. You did good. And we got back and <laughs> funny enough when we got back and I remember like cuz people had like oh you can tell like there's like message traffic oh like dude went kinetic like oh they went kinetic again like oh like, they're having an emergency coming home. It's like what's going on? That's like all you know at the squadron. We uh we land and uh, one of the things that you do in debrief is, you know, as a weapons officer, I review every single employment to make sure like, are we spins tactics? Like what can we get better? Like lessons learned? Well, like when I employ, like I don't, I don't debrief myself. Right. So Tom is the one who debriefs my stuff and I debrief his, right. So it's checks and balances. Cause he, he was the wing weapons officer attached. Like we're in the same flying squadron, obviously. Uh, so he land and he's like, he's like, dude, like, how was it? I'm like, just, just watch the tape, man. Just, just watch the tape. Like, You're like I need 10 minutes. I, Nobody I'm, talking to me. Yeah. Me well, I mean, we had, we had a lot of time to decompress on the way back, but still I was, yeah. I was like, 
going back through like the entire sortie of my head, I was flying back because it's pretty you know, a thousand miles to think about it, right? I'm like, like yeah, that was uh, that was definitely will push it up. So when we get back, it was uh, I just like just watch the tape, like like I I don't even want to write the the I'll I'll digest it later. Just write like do the after action report, but then you know you guys do the the, the tactical debrief. Like look at the tape. Like I don't I want to try to inject anything of like what what because i haven't seen the tape i was there but you know how you like you misremember things and oh, stuff yeah. i was like not even gonna try to speculate just watch the tape well i didn't even get a chance it sounds funny enough i didn't get a chance to actually look at my own tape for like a while because right like no kidding like the the next day like things with isis kicked off like literally the next day in iraq and syria and then this is afghanistan so we're like, what? what? Who's ISIS? Never heard of it. And so we got involved in that. And so that I moved on. Didn't really think much more about that story because I didn't have time. So who writes you up for that? Is it Tom? Uh, I don't know. The squadron. I think commander? it was squadron commander. I don't know. You have to ask him about that. Yeah. Because we'll I remember later. someone we'll told me. Later. Yeah. Because someone told me about it later. And he's like, hey, they, they submitted you for an award. I was like, oh, okay. I was thinking like like a single event air medal or something. I didn't realize like what they were submitting me for. I was like, oh. Oh, like, interesting. that's cool. Let's talk Syria. Um, I know we'll talk with Tom as well. So if you feel it's more appropriate, we have him here for it. We can hold, but, um, you know, I, I just love to hear kind of some of the flying experience you had there. That, yeah. So Tom, so we had a lot of shared experiences. The Syria is a really interesting one because we were both there in, in doing the same exact things on different shifts. Yeah. Uh, we actually didn't fly a single mission in Syria together in the same jet, uh, but we were, we were working it from two different angles. Uh, I, I'll give you a broad brush before we, we talk about things where we kind of overlap. So there was, there was a lot of stuff going on in Syria, the civil war, obviously. Uh, ISIS became a thing, and this is, you know, May, June. So, so ISIS kicks off, and we're... We're like, hey, we need to. Go, we, we're going to start doing missions in New Iraq. It's like, okay, you realize this is a thousand miles in the opposite direction. So we have Afghanistan; it's a thousand miles like northeast. We have Iraq, which is a thousand miles northwest, and we only have twelve jets in the squadron. Like, we're not even an eighteen jet squadron. Like, you're spreading pretty thin, and we're doing local training with the, uh, the like bilateral training to keep up foreign relations with the Emiratis. Uh, great people, by the way. So we're we're spread pretty thin. And so we were like, well, we're going to, we're going to go back in Iraq. Like, okay. Like, do, do we have an airspace control order or like, are there like frequencies or like, nope, nothing. Like we, it's not like we've never been there before. Like, can someone just go like, look at the, go in the chaos, like find the filing cabinet that has like, you know, Iraqi freedom, dust it off. Like it should be pretty simple. Right. Uh, so it was, it was an interesting to see like going from a place that we had been before, like how little institutional knowledge there was about just basic stuff. So we, we go into Iraq, we start doing stories. And at the time, this is like the, 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 the funny stories that those who know, know, um, anything that's like drones or Navy is typically not. <laughs> what, what is that? What do you mean? So, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff in the first like month, month and a half in Iraq, uh, not really Syria because Syria was acknowledged, but it was, it's the air force, but we don't acknowledge that we're doing it because we have bilateral host nation constraints yeah. because yeah. we have the Emiratis don't want to say that the F 15s and the air force are supporting this because that means that they're supporting it. And so you have host nation sensitivity. So whenever there's a kinetic, they just say, Oh, it's a drone strike or, Oh, it's the Navy. Cause, Cause it's they're like, on ships. Cause they're on ships. In international waters. That's right. Okay. So like 90% of like the first, I don't know, month or so of like airstrikes and stuff into Iraq for uh, counter ISIS was actually the air force. It was just said Navy and mm-hmm. drones and, and you know, people were like, Oh, that's must be true. Like, yeah, go ahead, go with that. <laughs> so we're, we're making news every day and like no one knows it. We're like, Oh, this is weird, but yeah, it is what it is. It's the life we live. So, uh, but yeah, Iraq was weird because it, it, it started as like humanitarian, it was a human, uh, humanitarian crisis in the North. And it was like, uh, uh, the Yazidis, I think it was, uh, west of Mosul. Like we were there for like the, those, uh, airdrops. That was just, I was overhead watching like, just like how bad that got. Like it was a, there was a mountain. They had climbed up this mountain and I can't remember the name of the mountain. Oh man. I know it's escaping me. 
I remember the targeting pod footage of watching like there's it is a road that wrapped around the mountain and th- this road had, I'm not kidding you, like 500 vehicles that all had been parked and all of these people are trying to escape like the, the ISIS that's coming across. And so they're going like looking for high terrain. So there's hundreds and hundreds of people that are stuck and stranded on the top of this mountain trying to get away from ISIS. Mm-hmm. So we are bringing in uh, some, some, task force guys and uh doing some airdrops for humanitarian stuff and even the humanitarian stuff didn't go very well because to, if uh if anyone's been involved in that one of the things like if someone is like starving to death and they don't have food they don't have water and you have a string of like airdrops with pallets coming in when the first pallet hits and these are big pallets what do you think people are going to do they got to run to the pallets. They don't know that there's 10 other pallets in the air that are very, very big and heavy. So there's a lot of pallets that, that didn't end up so well. So, uh, so they learned their lesson of like stringing that, Hey, we have to do a consolidated airdrops because people on the ground, it's like, you have to, this is human nature, right? Like account for human nature. So yeah, that was going on. But the, the tripwire, interestingly enough was, uh, Erbil. So there was a, there was a bridge and the bridge became like the red line. Like, hey, we're gonna manage this, we're gonna do what we can. Like, we're just trying to figure out what's going on. We have no US people on the ground. Um, it's this is all like secondhand info through like, you know, human and and resources. And I'm like, okay. So, but one thing we did know is like there's a consulate and we there's a bridge, and the bridge was like it was like 10 miles, I think, from the consulate on this uh the small river. Like that, that is the the red line. If anything gets within 10 miles of the consulate, that is the kinetic authority. So, uh, the first kinetic attack, I want to say it happened and I have no August 8th, August 10th, somewhere around that time frame, 2014 was the first kinetic strike in Iraq for counter ISIS. Tom actually did that. <laughs> it wasn't even me. Uh, he's got a funny story about that. Uh, you can tell it when, when it gets there. So I thought he wasn't on the first night. Oh no, that's in Syria. Oh, okay. Syria. Sorry, we're talking about yeah. Iraq. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. This is Iraq. Syria is a whole different all right. story. So, so that happens, and then what happens? Uh, in, people would be uh, surp- surprised or not surprised to, to figure out how the, how we actually deal with crisis. You know, as the United States military, every day or every I think it was every shift at one point, they would go. The National Security Council would then draw a, a boxes of like, these are the boxes that you can do airstrikes in. These are the boxes you cannot, like if it's not in the box, like you can't you do cannot. it. So we had, we had a situation where we, we launched with like, you know, and it's a thousand mile trip. So you're doing eight to 12 hour missions. You launch with your latest Intel, you go, you're getting talk on like, this is your target. You drop the weapon and like, Hey, it wasn't out. It's not inside the box. Like, listen, like, what do you mean? Like, oh, well, we moved the line an hour ago. Like, well, how am I supposed to know? Like, it's like things like that would happen. Yeah. And you're like, come on. Uh, and and the, the thing that makes it even funnier is that uh, there, was a, there was a time when we had to change our tactics. You could only go kinetic if, a, if it was a three-star or above had a FMV feed of the target. And you're like, are you kidding me? Like, like no fighters have, like, FMV feed through, like, beyond line of sight. So we were coming up with all kinds of funny tactics of how, we, how can we get an FMV feed to someone who gives strike approval? And there are sometimes you're like, okay, we got the bad guy, we got the FMV feed, like, oh yeah, the three star, he's uh, he went to lunch, he'll be back. And like, like, are you kidding me? Like, this is how we're dealing with crisis? So it was frustrating beyond belief to see, like we, we'd bring an MQ-9 or M, an MQ-9 over, like, hey man, like, I just need your sensor. Yeah, just, you just give me your feed. There. Like yeah. lays this target. Like, okay. And, and that guy, you know, again, q 9 has got one radio. So we're like, JTAC, go on, go on sipper. Look at this feed. Okay. That's the feed. You need the feed to your strike authority. And like, okay. So we're bringing MQ nines. We're using their feed and just pulling them around. Like, so we can do airstrikes. Yeah. And then we had some, you know, uh, there was, if you could, if you're within like Rover range of, of Erbil, we had, you know, land guys there, a couple of them, they could pump that, uh, back to the United States, but all of them were like people in the United States are like hand picking targets through FMV feeds. Like it's, it was dangerous, dangerous, very dangerous. Um, 
But one of the good things was it was easy to find the the, the guy, uh, the ISIS early. Turns out because they wanted to be known, they would put these flags on all their vehicles. So like one of the things you'd have to find is like, I see a vehicle, it's going like eastbound and it's got a black flag on it. Like, okay, like find me an FMV feed. <laughs> Are yeah. they in the box? Are they in the find, box? <laughs> find me a feed. Jeez. Look, I feel like there's two hours left that we could talk here. <laughs> and I want to make sure we, we and we'll, we'll talk with Tom together. I want to talk about the merge though a little bit. I want to make sure we get some time to talk about this. Okay. You, obviously, we don't even get to the time at uh, the test squadron, is it? And Tom talked a little bit about his time there. Um, but once you get out, why do you start this newsletter? It starts as a newsletter, becomes yeah. a podcast, right? And, and this is no small newsletter. It's 20,000 and counting. Um, podcast has 30 to 40 episodes. Yeah. Am I right like on that? that? Yep. Where does it all start for you? Uh, COVID actually. So I was, uh, I've, I didn't tell you about my all my other weird assignments I've had. I uh, worked in the Pentagon. I worked in Congress. I uh, did a short time at DARPA. Well, one of the things I, I did was I actually had a fellowship in Silicon Valley while I was on active duty. And this was in uh, 2020, January of 2020. When it all happened. Yeah. So I was like in San Francisco, like the cruise ship that's with uh, the COVID and all like, oh, let's see the cruise ship. Like I saw it all happen from you know, real time. But um but when I was out there, got a, a lot of a lot more tools for the toolbox, right? Um, I came back, COVID hit. I was looking for something to do that was like, how do I aggregate like information to find out what's going on in like in the in defense tech space? Turns out there's actually not any good outlet that that focuses on that. They focus on you know deployments or hey, this is a uniform change or this commander got hired or fired. Like yeah, yeah like there's there's no value besides there's no value in industry of that, right? It's mm -hmm. not value. Like where's the valuable stuff? How can I you know do that? There's not an outlet. Like okay, so I so during COVID I said, well, what if let me see if I can leverage some of the things that I've started to learn from uh, Silicon Valley. Like how do I set up a website and things like that? Like I don't know. I don't know anything. So I, I started as a hobby and I was like, well, how can I consolidate and capture like information that I, that's of interest to me and to our defense tech related. Right. So like the insider view of like what's going on, like the professional, like level of detail of stuff. So I figured out how to uh, source and aggregate that data. And then I said, well, since I'm, I'm already kind of going down this path, like how can I like turn it into something that someone else might want to, to look at too, can not just me. So how, how can other uh, people consume it? So that's kind of what started me like, well, I'll start a newsletter and I'll just mirror, I'll, I'll mirror it after a couple of other newsletters that I've seen that have like millions of people that read it. Um, mine does not have millions of people. <laughs> you getting there. <laughs> yeah, getting there. It's a little bad time. So, so I started like that and, uh, and I tried to, you know, it's, uh, say it makes sense to defense in an enjoyable way. Like most of the, defense reporting and stuff is it's either like journalist related it's clickbait or it's just people who just don't know what's going on right and then the people who do it's just dull like it doesn't have to be boring like there, there's you can have fun and learn at the same and have like for this very serious topic it, it's okay and I was trying to have a, a medium to say it's okay to actually like be a little lighthearted about stuff that's really serious it, it is okay so that's kind of how it started. And and the newsletter starts first and then the podcast comes online. Yeah. So I was doing the newsletter once a week, every Sunday. And there's a whole reason why I picked Sunday. Um, I still have a day job. So it's, it's my slop to fix it on Saturday and then publish it Sunday morning. And then I, I, so then from then I said, well, I have all this extra content that I'm just like deleting. I, I can't squeeze it into one email. So I said, well, I'll just, I'll dump the extra stuff into a, an email on like Tuesdays. And so that, I call that saved rounds. And so I've been doing that for about a year, a year and a half. And then uh, I asked, uh, I just asked the audience, I put a poll, like, what do you guys want us to do next? Right. Cause like, if I'm going to do something like, it's not going to be dumb. Right? Like, I want to spend time on dumb stuff. Right. So like, uh, I think it's Kanye West is like, do dope shit. <laughs> right? <laughs> what do you want to do? I just want to do dope right. shit. Right. Like, you know, before he's crazy. Like, yeah, that's good advice. Do dope shit. So I said, what do you guys want me to do next? And uh, did a poll for the readers and they said, everyone's do a podcast, like 99% of the responses do a podcast. Like, oh. Well, I've been on a couple of other podcasts before and actually delayed my own podcast for like six months. Cause I kept getting 
request to be on other people's podcasts. I finally had to say, all right, guys, like stop. I need to actually like launch my own. I'm, I'll come back in like six months. Um, but being a, a, a guest on other shows, just like yours, like you learn something every time. Absolutely. It's all a continual learning. So I was, I was glad to have had those opportunities to be on so many different types of shows and different types of content, mediums, that kind of thing. Uh, everything from like the format to the tech setup to all the little nuances that we could nerd out, you know, mm-hmm. off camera <laughs> yep. later today, I'm sure we will. Um, but I, I also decided like, Hey, I, I know this is hard. This is like podcast is a ton of work. People don't realize like how much work it is. Like an hour long podcast turns out takes way more than an <laughs> more hour, than one hour. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I occasionally bring in some people to help, uh, co-hosts and stuff or help, or help set up like guests and things. And so mm-hmm. I've got a, I got a couple of friends that help me on that, but yeah. Awesome. All right. Now there's two things I like to ask everybody before we wrap up. One is, is there anything you carried with you when you were flying that, or maybe while you were deployed, I should say that had sentimental value, good luck, charm, something that somebody gave you that you just wanted to have close by two things. Uh, the first is, uh, on my first deployment, actually no, it was my second. Yep. I had a, I had a dog tag made. It's like laser, the laser etched and it has like a picture of my kids. So I carried that as an extra dog tag. So I carried that from my second deployment on. And and now, you know, it's unrecognizable. The kids are tiny and they're big now. They're, so I've got that in a drawer somewhere at home. And then the other one, um, and I don't know why I started to doing it because at the time you, you don't know, but back in uh, early on, I, for some reason, had a couple extra dollars. I'm like, I'm just going to buy a flag and just throw it in my helmet bag. I go fly. And so I have a flag that I've flown almost every single one of those combat missions with me. And that's the flag. That's the only, I have very few things. So like I love me wall and I'll, I'll tell more story about one of the pictures, but I, I have a, from when I retired, I had my, uh, my office put that in a case for me, that flag. So you still have that. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Tom has one too. He, he was telling us about his flag. <laughs> Um, and then last question I ask everybody, just looking back, you, you've talked through some of the losses you've had. We haven't even touched on the near death stuff, which we'll probably talk to Tom about as well. But as you look back on the years in the Marine Corps, in the Air Force, um, tough times, but would you go back and do those again? Yeah, I wouldn't be who I am with where I came from. I mean, you are your experiences. Any, any good stories about Fischl, Stinger? <laughs> Before we wrap. Oh, oh. he was probably, uh, it's going to sound funny in a, in a, in a good way. He was probably one of the most annoying lieutenants that, that ever, I ever worked in the same squadron with me. And I say it as a compliment because that man would, was consistently like, he'd be in like the very basic, like you're still in like qualification training you don't know anything. Just do what you're told. I'm I, your grade sheets are based on. Can you do X, Y, and Z? Yes or no? Like just stick to the basics. And he, he would be so inquisitive about like things that are like way beyond like what, like, dude, you're going to fail this ride tomorrow. If you don't study, you want to pontificate about like these tactics, tactical, you know, what about isms and things and just looking at permutations of derivations of tactics and ideas and concepts. And, uh, so and, like, great inquisitive mind always thinking about things like that so but it was funny i was like like great i love the initiative like bad timing bad timing so, perfect <laughs> but he's uh but obviously like he's had his own career and he's come a long way and and that that you know, it that's a good problem to have right so people like that like dude you lean into people like that like yeah like you're you and i are going to be best friends just not in the next not 24 hours <laughs> um we'll have links to the merge obviously but just if you can voice over where can people find it uh the merge.co that co uh couldn't afford the m so the merge.co and they can the get website. the podcast there yep you get the newsletter the podcast obviously the youtube apple podcast spotify all the places just look up the merge that's where we're at perfect thanks so much Thanks, uh, Paco, for coming out. And we'll have you and Gunny uh, together here shortly. Now that's going to be fun. Yeah, be fun. All right. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> right. I hope you enjoyed that combat story with uh, Paco as a second round interview. Just uh, tons of combat experience. What a great guy. And I think you'll enjoy the merge as well if you check out that newsletter or uh, his podcast. He's also interviewing vets. Oftentimes, he's talking more deeply about the procurement and what's going on in the defense space, but I do think it's 
worth a listen if you find that interesting, which I think most people who listen to this will. As always, if you can, check out our newsletter, combatstory.com slash newsletter. And if you can, help support us on patreon.com slash combatstory. It would be greatly appreciated. But at a minimum, please do subscribe, turn on your notifications, uh, give this video a like. And if you can, leave us a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. It goes a long way to helping us reach more vets. Uh, with that, a couple uh, couple good comments. This on uh, round two of the Tom Gunny Moser interview. First is from at ONG Infinite in your area, a subscriber, which I say thank you for. This guy is everything. I constantly go back and forth on whether I'd want to be a Marine infantry or aviator in either branch. This guy did both. Truly inspirational. True. He did a whole heck of a lot. And he was a cop somehow. Then we've got at Boss Baby 2112. He says, this is one of those guys that makes me a 29-year-old man want to drop everything and follow my dreams. The only issue, weed and non-correctable vision to LMAO. I love living vicariously through these heroes keep up the great work ryan uh appreciate that comment that's that's a great one and uh lastly from chelan sc i'm sure i got that wrong but also a subscriber so i have to say thanks it says oh my god clone him <laughs> and for those who uh just listen and haven't seen uh tom it's just great he's exactly what you expect as as a cop uh marine 0311 um, that tough fighter pilot so it's uh, great to hear that thanks for all the comments y'all and i hope you have a great rest of the week or weekend wherever you are stay safe